how did you know she was gonna betray us? What'd she say? It was in her eyes, in the way she was leading us. But you said you knew Spanish. Our assumptions about where disabled people do and don't belong are reflected by and reinforced by inaccessibility. I'm Britt, I'm a disabled law student, and I recently argued my first case in court. In appellate court, each lawyer gets about 30 minutes to stand at a podium in front of a panel of judges and make their argument. I noticed so many layers of inaccessibility as I was waiting for my case to be called, but I want to talk about one thing, which is the podium. The podium where the lawyers have to speak at is not accessible to wheelchair users or to little people. As someone who's been a wheelchair user and a mobility aid user, there are times when I cannot stand for 30 minutes unassisted. Fortunately, this was not one of those times, but there wasn't an alternate setup. I thought it was so interesting that the audience area was more or less set up to be accessible, but the tables for the lawyers, the podium for the lawyers, none of that was set up to be accessible. We think a disabled person might come hear the court proceedings, but we don't think that they might be the lawyer. We are not expected to belong on that side of the room. It is so interesting the assumptions that you see when you start paying attention to the spaces where we do and we don't create access. The native representation of Mean Girls is incredibly important. With that in mind, let's talk native representation in media. I'm native of the Lumbee tribe and this has been a series on my TikTok, so let's dive into it. So in the new Mean Girls movie, which is based on the musical, which is based on the 2004 film, the character of Janice is played by Auli'i Kravaleo, who is Kanaka Maoli, or Native Hawaiian. And to reflect Auli'i's indigenous heritage, Janice's last name has been changed from Ian to Imeike, which translates to striving for the summit or striving for the stars in Olelo Hawaii. And what I love about Janice in the new Mean Girls is that being native is a tiny part of her character. While we need indigenous characters whose heritage is an important part of their story, it's equally as important to have characters whose indigenous heritage is a footnote to the broader narrative. Because of this, having Janice be so subtly and casually native is really meaningful. Additionally, I also love that they've made Janice canonically queer. Media usually only portrays native women as being heterosexual, oftentimes having them fall in love with white men. By having Janice be a complex queer indigenous woman, Mean Girls is pushing back against this trope, demonstrating just how diverse the experiences of native people can be. Maple syrup is just tree blood. I'm gonna show you how to get your own. This behind me is a red maple. I can tell because of how it is. But if you don't know how to tell, a lot of times maples will still have their maple flyers on them over the winter. And you can tap any maple for sap. This guy also has reddish rounded buds at the end of its branches. If you're looking for a book to get better at recognizing trees during the winter time, this is the one I would recommend, Winter Tree Finder. It's been winter for a while and we're going through this process of it being below freezing at night and above freezing during the day. That is the primo time for tapping maples. Also, because of climate change, uh, we that might be up in the air, the whole maple tapping thing and how far south you can do it. The bit on my drill is specifically for trees. It has a sharper front angle and it's the right size for my spiles. This is a spile. This is what's gonna go into the tree and the sap's gonna drip out of it. Oop, that is a damp hole. Now it's time to put in our spile and then use my handy dandy mallet that y'all tell me reminds you of Garnet from Steven Universe and we're going to just Tap, 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 tap. Oh my goodness, it's tree blood. Because I'm really cheap, I just cut a hole in this distilled water jug. I cut it to fit onto the spile. Now on this tree, I have two jugs, two spiles, because it is bigger than 25 inches in diameter. Here comes another drop. Now in some parts of Korea, they just drink the sap straight. It's like a end of the winter season, beginning of the spring tonic. But of course, here in North America, we have the grand old tradition of maple syrup. Good morning. It's time to go check on our maple blood. I love this maple twig. It looks like a wand. <laughs> It's time to dump what we have into this jug to take home. We got like a goodly amount in these guys. Almost a gallon of sap. Thank you, tree friend. I'll be back to check on you later. Another morning, another sap gathering. Oh man, we had good flow yesterday. Nearly another gallon. And now fire. One of the things I was known for as a camp counselor was my fire moment. And now I'm pouring my two gallons of sap into a pretty strong hotel pan over a fire. Most people sugar outside or in a sugar shack because there's so much moisture in it, you might take the paint off your walls. Oh, my eyes are sweating. 
you hear all these birds? I don't know. I'm probably just being dumb, but I'm just sitting here thinking of all of the people who have sugared before me outside listening to these same bird songs. Do the birds know? Oh Lord, she's boiling. It has been just under an hour. It has cooked down a lot and we're starting to get some color. Hello, we're inside now with our almost maple syrup. I'm finishing it on the stove top. I am pouring this through that filter to catch any of the big crystals of minerals in there or any stray pieces of ash. Okie dokie. I think it's time to pour off our maple syrup. Maple syrup. Yes, it takes a lot of work. Yes, this is the amount of energy that goes into all maple syrup. The real stuff. We're not talking about the, the corn syrup flavored stuff. Now, earlier in the season, I'm told that maple syrup tends to be a little bit lighter. But that is part of the reason why we are kicking it with an amber colored syrup. And it's still really liquidy because it's still really hot. Let's try some. Bone apple teeth. Bing. It's delicious. I knew it was going to, I knew it worked, but it, I'm still amazed by it every time. Mmm, it's so good. And it's still the beginning of sugaring season, so I get to make more. Once I get home from LA, I'm about to fly to LA. <laughs> Let me know if you end up tapping any maples or birches or walnuts or sycamores. Happy snacking, don't die. Oh, it's so good. This is sugarcrete, and as you've probably guessed, it's an alternative to concrete made from sugarcane, and they can make ultra strong blocks with a 95% lower carbon impact than concrete blocks. They've been created by the University of East London, and this is how they're made. When sugar is produced, a fibrous byproduct called bagasse is left behind. Even though there's a lot of great uses for this, it's usually just burnt as fuel which pollutes our environment. But if you mold and weave the fibers together, you can create a really strong building block. Testing is still being carried out to understand the extent of its strength, but it's at least strong enough to bear the loads of whole structures, flooring and walls. And like concrete, it's also very resistant to fire, but much more insulative. Concrete is expensive and terrible for the planet, so having an affordable alternative could make it far easier for people to build and maintain their homes, especially in lower income countries that produce sugarcane too. Would you like to see more buildings made of sugarcrete? Hit the like button if you would and drop your thoughts on this in the comments. I hate it when boys are like, I prefer less makeup. Like, okay, wear less then. Hey everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Say What History. This is a show about black history where we talk about some people that you know, talk about some people that you don't know, talk about some events so crazy it'll make you say what? <laughs> Today, let's talk about Marisa Lico Williams. Marisa Lincoln was born in 1849 in Mississippi. Thanks to a wealthy benefactor, she was able to study music basically full-time as she was a child. While in her early 20s, she actually moved to Chicago and then to San Francisco to further her studies in Italian operatic singing. And she made her debut as a concert soprano singer in 1876. But on November 18, 1878, just two years after her concert debut, Maria Celica Williams performed in the green room of the White House. Introduced by Frederick Douglass, she performed for an audience that included President Rutherford B. Hayes and Mrs. Hayes. Now, it was back in San Francisco where she met her husband, another singer. After her performance at the White House, Williams continued the tour nationally performing for all black audiences with her husband. The thing is, we're still dealing with the Jim Crow South here. Despite her reputation and talent, she had difficulty obtaining quality management and was actually known for organizing her own tours. She would split her time between a national tour and an international tour, touring all over Europe, even giving a command performance for Queen Victoria at St. James Hall in October of 1883. Williams also performed at the Chicago's World Fair in 1893. Williams was one of the most recognized and lauded black American women singers of the late 19th century, but black people would not be allowed to the American operatic stage until the 1930s. Thanks for watching another episode of Say What? history. I'll see you next time. Four black LGBTQ heroes you should know about for Black History Month and beyond. One, Marsha P. Johnson, who was a trans woman before we had modern language for trans identity. Activist and performer who played a major role instigating the Stonewall Riots, one of the most important events leading to the modern LGBTQ plus rights movement.
Two, Bayard Rustin, the chief organizer for the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom and key advisor to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. himself. He has never gotten enough credit for his role in the civil rights movement due to a lack of acceptance of his sexuality as a gay man. Three, Audre Lorde, a lesbian feminist, womanist, and civil rights activist. Her writing about the mythical norm helped me to understand how oppressive power structures can hide in plain sight as idealized notions of what types of people are seen as valuable or normal in society. And four, James Baldwin, a gay playwright, novelist, essayist. His work taught me about many of the ways that I've been taught to hold internalized negative beliefs about my own racial identity. And his teachings taught me a better and truer vision of what it is to be a black man in the United States. Our celebration of Black History Month is incomplete if it does not include the powerful contributions of our LGBTQ plus siblings as well. Share this video if you learned anything from this list of اهدى ما هو كل شي باين في المحنة الله الله بيشهد مين احنا رجالة ده من طر تشلق بنضرب حرب الليلة ما بنغلب بدك جبال وعادي من هدلك مرحب فيك في ولاد القدس من دبر حالنا محل اللغز رنات على نفحة Say peacock and no one bats an eye Say poopcock and society goes wild Thank you, Jenny, for the inspiration to make this video. There are numerous examples of this happening and I'm gonna list like a few just to remind y'all. One, The Little Mermaid. Two, Iris and Barry from The Flash. Sarah and Bucky from The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Vampire Diaries, I'm pretty sure. Bridgerton with Queen Charlotte. Bridgerton again if that casting rumor is true, which I really hope it is. These were just like the light examples, but no matter where you go, no matter if that's an official couple or not, there will always be an outrage. And I'm gonna tell you why that is. This outrage happens whenever girls feel like their representation is getting taken away. Especially when it comes to remakes of t different types of media that they saw themselves in. I'm gonna give you another example. Say the black female character is flirting with that white male character. Oh my gosh. People are going to say like, oh, she was making him uncomfortable. He doesn't like the flirting, da 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 But if a white girl was flirting with that same character, nothing wrong with it. This happened so much to where I have to like prepare myself like mentally for all the backlash that this potential couple or even potential couple is going to get. These people will reach down into the gutter just to figure out what's wrong with this ship or what could be wrong with it. It's like a part of my life now to where like I'm used to it and now whenever it happens I just look at those people like they're stupid because like what are you doing? I genuinely do hope it gets better though so girls who look like me don't have to go through that in the future. We have sensory issues. Of course we have random bruises all over our body from bumping into things. We have sensory issues. Of course we have abnormally high or low pain thresholds and we don't get to decide which is which when it happens. We have sensory issues. Of course we have sudden aggressive outbursts that we don't really mean, but they affect our relationships anyway. We have sensory issues. Of course I hated being forced to give hugs as a kid. Wait, even grandma? Especially our grandma. We have sensory issues. Of course I picked my nails every single time I was bored, sometimes until they started to bleed. We have sensory issues. Of course we have extreme sensitivity to rejection of any kind. Especially if it's from your grandmother, who told you that she well, loved you. Well, this, this is grandma thing is starting. We have sensory issues. Of course we have difficulty in creating and maintaining meaningful relationships. You hear that, grandma? Bro, we can't do- Dude, you gotta, the grandma thing, that's, you gotta stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not what the video's about, dude. I, I like, know. I get that you're kind of going through that, but like, let's just, let's just keep going, yeah? Right. We have sensory issues. Of course, sometimes we suffer from extreme social isolation because we just can't be around large groups of people. Especially one bro, of the- Bro, bro, don't say it! Dude, it's because I'm adopted, she treated me that way. Okay. Uh, you know what? <laughs> We're done.